Good day to all of you. So we're already in Chapter 16 of the Operating Systems Lecture Series, which is all about security. So I hope that your brains are all ready because we will learn many terms and many situations in which how does the um, security is compromised and how to solve these issues with regards specifically for uh, computer security issues. So again, let's start our lesson. So again, this chapter is all about security. So the contents of this chapter are, we have the security problem, and then we have program threats, system and network threats, cryptography as a security tool, user authentication, implementing security defenses, firewalling to protect systems and networks, computer security classifications, and we have an example that will uh, show you the secure, how does the security works in Windows 7. So the objectives of the chapter are discuss security threats and attacks, explain the fundamentals of encryption, authentication, and hashing, examine the uses of cryptography in computing, and describe the various countermeasures to security attacks. So the security problem so system secure if resources used and accessed as intended under all circumstances. But of course, it is unachievable because of, uh, we face many situations. Why uh, it's unachievable? Because there are intruders, uh, unfortunately, and then these intruders are also called crackers. So crackers is not food. Actually, this came from a type of uh, hacker. So hacker in uh, in early days when the word is introduced, um, hacker has a bad connotation. But now hackers, um, def uh, specifically or generally, has two types. We have the white hat hacker, and then we also have the black hat hacker. So white hat hackers are these are the hackers which are. Um, employed by a company to test the security, how strong or how good is the security of this company in terms of their in their in their uh, IT infrastructure. So that's the white hat hacker, while the black hat hackers or the term now is crackers. So these are the people who have nothing to do, um, but to uh, um, it's like um, the, the, the reasons why they're doing hacking is that they want to prove themselves that they are the best. And of course, the, the other part is it's, all, it's okay with, uh, if it's the reason. They, they only want to prove that they are the best hackers in the world. Or the other is, which is a bad thing, which uh, causes uh, the sufferings of many people with, for example, credit cards. They stole personal information and they use it for their own benefit and of course the one who's suffering is of course for example the addict the owner of the credit card because he or she is using his or her accounts to buy and uh, is going to pay is the of course of course the credit card owner so this intruders or crackers attempt to breach security so the definition of threat is a potential security violation and then an attack is an attempt to breach security. So it's like a threat will become an attack if it is already an attempt to breach security. So attack can be accidental or malicious. So there are histories of viruses that are not intended to, are not intended actually to create. It's just uh, by means of programming, of course, viruses are also programs. And that's unintentional. But of course, the attack can be malicious, such as, again, per, um, um, getting personal information without the consent, uh, stealing, of course, and then you have do these all kinds of things that is uh, uh, out, of, um, out of ethics or morals of a human being in using a computer. So it is easier to protect against accidental than malicious misuse because malicious, you have the intent to to harm other people by by using technology okay so that's why it is said that it's easier to protect against accidental because it's unintentional okay next is we have the security violation categories so we have the breach of confidentiality so unauthorized reading of data so if you can remember the there is a um 
um, between China and the Philippines with the, the West Philippine Sea. So what did the Chinese hackers did? They um, uh, exposed some of the personal information in, um, in a website, in a government website. So that is already a breach of confidentiality. And then next is we have the breach of integrity. So unauthorized modification of data. So these viruses are doing those things. Um, it make your files use, uh, useless once um, the virus, sometimes it, uh, it's very good if it only hides the files. What if it really corrupts the files? So that is already a breach of integrity. And then breach of availability. So unauthorized destruction of data. This is also worse if the company or any offices does not have a backup for that data. And then theft of service, unauthorized use of resources. And then we also have the denial of service or DOS, prevention of legitimate use. So an example of denial of service is, for example, your ser you have a server that, uh, of course, services, gives your um, services to the clients, but then an attacker um, floods your server that, uh, that looks like the server has uh, has clients. For example, your the capacity of your server is 100 clients. What the hacker did is that uh, he or she flooded your server that uh, that looks like that there are 100 clients, but actually there is no client at all. So what is the disadvantage of this DOS is that the legitimate clients who wants to use your service will not be accommodated because the server thought that their uh, that its capacity is full. So that is the denial of service. Okay, we have also so uh, security violation methods. So first is we have the security violation categories. And then next is we have the security violation methods. So we have masquerading. So masquerade, um, it looks like you're wearing a mask. So in, in, a, in a literal term. So this is breach authentication. So, pretending to be an authorized user to escalate privileges. So, that's masquerading. And then we have this replay attack, as is or with message modification. So, what is a replay attack? So, it is a malicious or fraudulent repetition of a valid transmission. For example, you have a sender and you have a um, receiver. And then there is the um, hacker, for example. What will this do is um, uh, normally, if you're going to send a message, you're the sender, then of course your intended receiver will receive, uh, will receive that message. What this, uh, this attacker or hacker is, um, he or she will get your message. Your, your message, uh, as is said, it can be as is or it can modify the, uh, your message and then it will be sent to the intended recipient. So that is a replay attack. So uh, this, the receiver has no idea that the message is already intercepted by the attacker. So that's the problem. What if, for example, um, you're, you're, already in, you're in a company and then um, you send a very um, uh, sensitive information and then the attacker in, uh, gets your original message and then ask, for example, uh, ask for um, transfer of funds. So uh, the, the receiver who has no idea that it is already intercepted will give the details and what if for the, uh, for the, for the uh, fund transfer, so there's a possibility that it can, it can be transferred to the account of the hacker. So that's just an example of a replay attack. So the idea here again for the replay attack is that the attacker or the hacker will get the original message from the sender and then he or she is the one who will be sending it to the intended recipient. Okay, next is we have the man in the middle attack. So intruder sits in data flow masquerading as sender to receiver and vice versa. So actually man in the middle attack is an umbrella term for replay attack meaning uh, man in the middle attack is uh, more of a uh, general term, then replay attack is um, um, he, uh, he or she will send the information. While man in the middle attack can also do what the uh, replay attack 
workers do, but man in the middle can, uh, it can only as uh, benign or it can only uh, want to to get information. So that's the difference between man in the middle attack and replay attack. So replay attack is more specific than man in the middle attack, which can, of course, do that what the replay attackers are are doing or only uh, get the information. Okay, next is we have the session hijacking. So session hijacking is intercept an already established session to bypass authentication. And then next is we have privilege escalation. So common attack type with access beyond what a user or resource is supposed to have. So for privilege escalation, so if you're a guest, and then what if you get the username and password by means of hacking of the administrator. So knowing that from guest, you could be the administrator, even though you're, of course, you are not the administrator, his or herself. Okay, next is we have the security measure levels. So impossible to have absolute security, but make cost to perpetrator sufficiently high to deter most intruders. So security must occur at four levels to be effective. We have the physical, data center, servers, and connected terminals. So physical, of course, you're, you are securing or protecting the hardware. For example, in a company, you have security guards. And of course, um, these data centers or servers, they have, um, they have this, um, uh, for example, uh, biometrics for you to enter this um, computers so that it means that only authorized users can enter the vicinity or the area where the servers are there. Okay, next is we have application. Benign or malicious apps can cause security problems, of course. Uh, since, of course, viruses are, are programs, so uh, they can be benign. They are just there as a loophole or it can be, of course, malicious apps that can corrupt your files or uh, at most uh, unfortunately the our operating systems and then of course we have the operating system protection mechanisms and debugging for the OS they have for example for Windows specifically they have their own Microsoft Defender and they have their own firewall but then uh, as I read in the article it is better to have a separate uh, firewall or antivirus software other than what is offered by my uh, Windows 10 because um, of course, the viruses, if technologies are evolving, so as the vi the malware that is existing um, in, uh, in, in, the, in, the inter in the internet or in any other sites. And then network. So intercepted communications, interruptions, and then of course the denial of um, service. So that is why also uh, for network, um, firewall is also applicable here. So the, the the ports that are not valid, of course, will not be uh, will not be accessed. And then security is as weak as the weakest link in the chain. So meaning, even though the chain has more example uh, parts that are strong, if there is a one one of those uh, uh, links in the chain is weak. So though um, uh, it uh, the the chain is already strong enough, but still that is a problem with security security it's the analogy for that so humans are risk to via phishing and social engineering attacks so what is phishing so it's not the f but a ph so uh, phishing means um a hacker or the one who intended to to steal personal information will create for example in a website will create for uh, facebook for example um he or she the attacker will create the the interface a website has a very similar look and feel with facebook and then of course since there are no uh, there is no difference between the two so the unknowing user will input his username or password and then it is said when he or she entered this logged in his username his or her password then there is a notification that the password is not correct so it means that it means that it is uh, the site has already recorded in username and password for example Facebook, and then when you're going to again to to access to the legitimate Facebook site, then you cannot 
um, access anymore your profile because uh, you've, uh, the the, uh, the hacker has already stolen your uh, username and password by means of that uh, fake site. So that is an example of phishing with a PH and not F. And then what is social engineering attack? So actually social engineering, it looks very, what is this a program? Is this a type of an engineering program just like mechanical engineer or um, electrical electronics and communications engineer but not, it's not like that. Social engineering means, uh, an example for you to understand social engineering is you are fooling people. For example, you're, you're in a company, then you're going to chit-chat with people, and then uh, and this unknowing victim will accidentally share his or her personal information. Or another is, example, um, of course, the company. That's why the company already employs uh, the, uh, uh, the, the file that is to be destroyed, incinerated, or to be... Um, I forgot the term, the, the, the device that cuts the paper into many pieces, specifically for, for financial data, so that um, no one can see, because, of course, financial data is very sensitive. If you're just going to throw the paper because of wrong printing, um, it, can be, um, it can be accessed or it can be uh, acquired, of course, by hackers. Oh, this company owns this large sum of money, so it's like that. So that's also a type of social engineering. Um, they're going to actually to the literal trash bins of the company to see important uh, data. Or another one for social engineering is um, he or she just watches your shoulder. So this is uh, it is already mentioned here in the next uh, slides. Then he will see your username and password. So that's why the solution now, as you can see, for the passwords, it is it is uh, it has a, um, a masking for password. Uh, the the common masking for password is the asterisk or dot so that the if someone uh, is a social engineer that will look onto your username and password he he or she will not be able to distinguish the password since it is masked by an asterisk or a dot so the question now here is but can too much security be a problem of course especially for managers so for instance so every time that a manager will enter the vicinity and will use some services, uh, he, he or she will undergo the security procedures and, for example, for the files. So it's like that the manager will complain that are you, uh, don't they trust the people, specifically those people in high positions, because every time there is a security check. So it can be very inconvenient for users specifically for for people uh, who already have a high positions in the company that they will always undergo this strict security measures so that the the uh, the the the, cost, uh, the problem here would be the inconvenience of users every time they you're going to do something there is a security check okay next is we have program threats so program threats has many variations and many names. So we have a Trojan horse. So code segment that misuses its environment, exploits mechanisms for allowing programs written by users to be executed by other users. So types of Trojan horses are spyware, pop-up browser windows, and covert channels. So up to 80% of spam delivered by spyware infected systems so trojan horse so how does this program threat name to be trojan horse so if you are familiar with greek mythology or the greek literature so trojan horse comes from of course it's a literally a horse in a greek literature so i i don't know if you're familiar with the trojan war a war between greeks and trojans okay um, Trojans are, are in the, in based on the literature, Trojans are known to have a very strong hold um, ca uh, city because of thick walls. No one can uh, attack them. No one can beat them because of that stronghold of their city. So since Greeks, uh, of course, is having a hard time to, to defeat the, uh, the Trojans, so they create a 
uh, they create this Trojan horse. So Trojan horse is a very big horse, a wooden horse at, at the, in the literature. And then they, it contains inside uh, people. So that's their strategy in which the Greeks will hide inside that big wooden horse. And then uh, this wooden horse will be placed at the, sh uh, at the shore or a bay of near, uh, near the city of Troy. And then these Trojans, when they uh, saw it in the morning that it's already in the uh, at the shore, there is uh, I, I don't remember who the name was. Of course, it I think it's not significant anymore. One of the Trojans said that they, sh they should burn that, but most of the Trojans says that no, it is a a gift from the gods. It's their victory trophy. So what they did is this Trojan horse was um. It was brought inside the the city of Troy, and of course, the Trojans celebrated their victory that the Greeks cannot defeat them because of their uh, very strong walls. So they celebrated, of course, since they celebrated, they have alcoholic drinks. So of course, unknowingly, they they slept, and then that that is the time that the Greeks went outside and just um, defeated the Troys because uh, the Troja, the the city of Troy because of course um, they've already penetrated inside by means of that wooden horse so that is why it is called a Trojan horse so Trojan horse sometimes it looks like a legit uh, for for a computer sense uh, Trojan horse looks like an innocent or a legitimate app but then again there's something is lurking bad inside that um, application that can wreak havoc in your computer systems. So that is a Trojan horse. So that's why spyware. So there are, of course, legitimate software that you think that, oh, it's it's a legitimate, uh, legitimate program. Uh, as my personal experience, of course, when I was in, I think when I was in high school, uh, as early as that, I already have a computer and an internet connection. And then... I installed this, I already forgot, of course, I don't need to remember. I installed this antivirus and then because my uh, my my system, uh, be, uh, my computer system became slow. So, so, so there is a pop up. Of course, I'm not really that knowledgeable at computer at that time. And then there's a pop up that yeah, I have to buy this antivirus software for it to remove. It can scan that there is a virus, but then again, if you want to remove it, I have to pay. So that is already an example of a spyware. So that time when I realized that, oh, um, there is a possibility that the one who makes the virus are also the one who creates the antivirus software for that. There are people or there are companies like that. So that if you are an unknowing, you are an innocent and an ignorant computer user, if you do have a credit card or you do have money, you can really be um, tempted to to buy that software. And it will not help you at all because it is just meant to um, get money from you. So that's an example of spyware. And then we also have this pop-up browser window. So if you're going to this adult sites, so I'll not mention this adult sites, you know what is that. So sometimes... Or it's not sometimes, it will really have a pop-up browser windows that even though you're not already accessing that adult sites, uh, it will pop up. What if your computer is your workstation and then you try to surf that um, those sites? Uh, what if your client saw that? So that means it's not just for the company, but for you as personally. Oh, the, so the person who who works in this computer likes this adult content. So, of course, it's also um, a not a very good image for us. And then also the covert channels, um, it's like a spyware. It's just in the form of a website or a channel that they look like a legitimate channel, but it is not. Uh, if you enter the, the channel, you can get, um, of course, program threats, malwares, and others. Okay, next is we have the trap door so specific user identifier or password that circumvents normal security procedures it could be implemented in a compiler so trap door meaning um it is a loophole in a computer system that sometimes 
um, only that programmer knows how. So um, uh, this is a security loophole in which um, a programmer can take advantage of. So sometimes what if um, in terms of financial, uh, in, in, uh, in stealing money, so that can be the application for the trapdoor by using that um, specific loophole. You can steal personal information or you can steal, of course, a bank accounts. And trapdoor is uh, specifically done in, uh, I, I, this is an old movie, War Games, a 1983 movie. It is, a, it is um, highly recommended, though it is as old as me, actually. But uh, that uses the, 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 the way uh, the hacker did it is by means of a trapdoor. So the question now is how to detect them. So the problem with trapdoor is that it takes years it to, uh, for it to be detected because it's a security loophole. So it can only be detected by example if the owner uh, if the operating system will be updated and it, it is detected. So actually trapdoor is very difficult to detect because it's it's like it's not a it's a passive program threat. It's just there. They are only uh, the trapdoor is only used for for a specific time or when the programmer uses it, but it's only there. Unlike with viruses that it really wrecks havoc or destroys your files. Okay, next is we have the four layered model of security. As it is said, we have the physical network operating system and application. So let's just uh, have um so, uh, discuss for per layer. So the type of type of attacks for uh, application is of course the logic bugs, design flaws, and code injection. So code injection is an attack that modifies otherwise well-behaved executable code. So I have this experience, another experience with it's. I, I think it's related with code injection. So I have this um, antivirus software that I've uh, I've uh, that I've been using since 2015. Um, when it up when the, the the antivirus software it's a free free version it when it was updated, I was really um, confused at the time because uh, at the time I'm still studying I'm still uh, finishing my master studies and then I have an open file which is I think it is an Excel file. Then the Excel file the logo of the Excel became a blank file a blank file the white one with paper so it became the uh it uh it uh the, the logo of that logo icon for excel and then when i closed it then i click um chrome because i want to research i want to research what happened what what has, has happened why does my uh my uh excel application became its icon became a blank file so I, I already have a hunch that wow, it's a virus a, a hacker attack or a virus it is a virus but I'm not doing anything at the time I just saw that it became a blank file and when I click the Google Chrome application oh the the icon of Google Chrome also became a blank file so oh no what what happened by clicking it it became a blank file so what I did is I shut it down because it in my in my uh, experience or in, in in thinking, if I'm going to turn it off, nothing will happen. So I, I did not open my computer for how many days, and I researched um, at work about what happened. Actually, I th I thought it was really a virus, but no, it is the fault of the antivirus software. Um, it really was actually the article was published that there is a mistake, the uh, in the anti and the antivirus that um um it uh the the virus uh, the antivirus thought that the all the applications that are running are all viruses so that's what happened so when i when excel which is a a an active um program is it loaded in memory so the antivirus thought it's a virus and then when i click the internet browser it also thought that it's a virus so that's why it became a blank file so there are solutions that is indicated. The funny thing here is the, the, uh, the advice is the first thing foremost is do not turn off the computer. Oh no, I already turned off the computer. So it means I really have a big problem. 
So when I opened my laptop again, it's not working anymore. It's like the operating system is, yeah, it's already described. If you turned it off, uh, the operating system will be corrupted. So really, it really is corrupted. I cannot open it. And then the problem is that when it, when it was 2015, um, UEFI is already the uh, uh, the interface for, for booting the computer, not the BIOS anymore. So it's really very different. So, so I really... Uh, I was really very, um, since the Windows is uh, included already in the computer system, so it's like, oh, it, I already paid it. So how, uh, how sad. Then when I tried to install, of course, other copies of, of, uh, of operating systems, so uh, I don't, don't want it. I want it to be the original. Okay? So what I did is, so my brand is Acer at the time, the laptop. And then um, to have, and unfortunately, I don't have the backup. Uh, uh, most of the laptops today does not have an operating system installation included, which is in the um, disk. So the problem now is how can I get the, the Windows installation um, since, of course, this to prevent piracy. So how do I get? the original backup at least so the solution in the acer website it's that it said that you have to know the batch in which the your your laptop is released then look for another laptop that has the same batch when it was released so oh no it's very difficult but then i remembered i have this student um um who has the, it's uh, his brother is or has already graduated, but of course the the sibling is still there. Uh, at the time, I remembered that the computer, which is also the same brand, I have the same. They have the same um, batch. It we, we bought it uh, at the same, almost at the same time. So, but before that, I I backed up the the laptop of uh, a friend who also has original windows and also another one at first it will con it will be successfully installed but then again if i connect to a computer into the internet it has a message that uh this copy of windows is already being used by another user so it's really correct that it is really used by another user so it means that um i cannot use that um operating system so the solution again let's go back the solution is to find or to to borrow the the laptop of that um, of that student, and uh, fortunately, um, um, I was obliged that uh, I can borrow his or her laptop, and then I I backed up his operating system, and then that backup I used it for uh, my laptop, and good thing, it was it was also of course the same batch, so there is no problem that. Um, unlike with the other operating systems, which are not its batch, corresponding batch, it says that it's used by another uh, computer. But for this one, it is already detected that um, these two laptops that I borrowed uh, have the same batch. So there's no problem with that. So the, the lesson there was um, you have to back up the, the operating system that is installed. Uh, if, if you're laptop has already an, an operating system that is already installed you need to back up for copy that's my first lesson and another one actually my our computer shop is not affected by the by by the app by the um, error of this antivirus so i was really very confused we are using just the same antivirus but why does the computer that is also open is not affected so the difference is that my husband has installed a firewall. It's actually a free file firewall called Zone Alarm. So that made a difference also. That the, our computer shop, the computers has a firewall. So if only I have a firewall such as uh, this uh, product, it's a free product actually, then I should have um, should have saved my computer or my laptop at that time and also. I am still studying there at Masters. I cannot afford to lose all of my data at that time. So that is an example of a 
code injection. That is unintentional, of course. It's an antivirus. Of course, they will be, um, they will have a bad image or bad publicity. So I think it's unintentional. So what are the attack prevention methods? So we have sandboxing and software restrictions. So what is sandboxing? So sandboxing, uh, of course, from the term sandbox, Uh, if you can remember, or I don't know, here in the Philippines, is there a sandbox at the park? If you can watch movies where children are playing at the park, and then there is a box with sand. And then, of course, they're building castles, they're building anything that what they, they want. So that is already the so-called sandbox. So how it is related with sandboxing in computer um, term? So sandbox means you're going to run your program inside that sandbox software and it is that is a malicious program or it will wreak havoc to your computer then the effects will only be inside that sandbox your whole computer system will not be affected so that is the usage of the term sandboxing okay next is we have operating system so insecure defaults platform vulnerabilities and then to prevent those attack, we have patches. So that's why specifically if your operating system is original, be responsible to update it. Because of course, your operating systems is not 100% perfect, but it is 100% functional. But still, there are still security loopholes that can be used as trapdoors by programmers who will want to... Uh, to abuse your your computer system. So it's really very important for you to really update your operating systems by means of patches. And then of course, reconfiguration. And then we also have this hardening. So hardening means improving the security features of your information or uh, rather of your operating system. Then for the network is we have sniffing. So sniff like a dog. So sniffing network traffic use uh, so you're uh, in the network traffic you will get useful information sniffing getting um important information in the network traffic so that is sniffing so what is spoofing so spoofing is imitation of a legitimate identifier such as an ip address by an illegitimate user or user so that is spoofing so that's why you are uh, fooling uh, someone. And then, of course, masquerading. Of course, we've already discussed that. And then the attack prevention methods in network is encryption, authentication, and filtering. And then for physical is we have the types of attacks is console access and hardware-based attacks. Example, stealing, stealing the server, the physical server. So that is already a type of attack for, for physical. And then attack prevention methods, of course, we have guards. So that's why there are security guards, there are vaults, and device data encryption. Okay, continuation with the program threats is we have the uh, malware. Software designed to exploit, disable, or damage computer. Malware. So it came, it came from malicious software. So it became a coined term. For short, malware. So, so viruses, Trojan horses, and any other software that is designed to exploit, disable, or damage the computer is generally called a malware. And then we have the Trojan horse again. So a program that acts in a clandest uh, clandestine manner. So clandestine meanings in a secretive manner. As I've said with the story with the Trojan horse, uh, they thought it's a, a trophy of victory, but not. It looks like a legitimate program, but it's not. So that is a Trojan horse. So again, they can be uh, an example of Trojan horses is the spyware. Again, program frequently installed with legitimate software to display ads and capture user data. And then we also have ransomware locks up data via encryption demanding payment to unlock it so my experience with regards to the antivirus for me to remove that virus is i need to pay so it's it's already a ransomware it's like you're uh, paying you 
uh, paying for a hold upper. And then others include, again, trap doors and logic bombs. So logic bomb is a remote access tool designed to operate only one specific set of logical conditions is met. So for example, this virus will only work every Monday at this time. So that's already a logic bomb. So there, there are logical conditions. And then all try to violate the principle of least privilege. So what is the principle of least privilege? So allow me to read. So every program and every privileged user of the system should operate using the least amount of privilege necessary to complete the job. The purpose of this principle is to reduce the number of potential interactions among privileged programs to minimum necessary to operate correctly so that one may develop confidence that unintentional, unwanted, or improper uses of privilege did not do not occur. So that is the principle of least privilege. For example, if you if you are a user who only wants to to view the data, so you can be a guest for that because you're only going to view the data. You don't need to modify, you don't need to print, just view. So I think the guest uh, the guest um, I, ID is already fine since that's only your purpose. So that is the principle of least privilege. So the goal for program threats is to um, leave behind a remote access tool for repeated access. So remote access tool, it is a backdoor daemon left behind after a successful attack to allow continued access by the attacker. So it is a type of back, uh, uh, trapdoor or again backdoor. So uh, uh, the... The hacker has already uh, compromised your computer system, but then it leaves this rat. So rat, so it's a very like a very demeaning term. So this rat for again, if you're going to return back to your system, he already has access. So this remote access tools can be used, for example, to make it a, uh, a botnet for denial of service attacks without e without the owner of the computer not knowing that it has already become a botnet okay so that is the purpose of remote access tool so we have this program with a c program with buffer overflow condition so so we have uh, uh, the problem with overflow condition so that is what the viruses are doing the buffer overflow condition. If there's a buffer overflow condition, it can uh, modify the parts of a file. So code review can help. So programmers review each other's code looking for logic flows and programming flaws. So again, for this program, so um, which occurs due to an unbounded copy operation, the call to str copy. But, but as I've said, uh, buffer overflow condition may overwrite the existing files. So that's what the viruses are doing or the malware is doing. Okay, next is we have the code injection attack. So occurs when a system code is not malicious but has bugs allowing executable code to be added or modified. So results from poor or insecure programming paradigms commonly in low-level languages like C or C++, which allow for direct memory access through pointers. Goal is a buffer overflow in which code is placed in a buffer and execution caused by the attack. Can be run by script kiddies. So what is the term of a script kiddie? An attacker uh, who did not design the attack but instead is using an attack designed by a more sophisticated attacker. So that's why it is called a script kiddie. It's also an attacker, but he is not the one who really designed that program to attack that uh, computer. So the script kiddies use tools written but exploit identifiers. So we have this uh, example here. So outcomes from code injection include, so we have this buffer and then padding for the buffer and then that then the buffer is overwritten by data and then there is this overflow and then this overflow it will uh, modify other variables so that's why we have overwritten variables and then the injection code and overwritten return address so that's it's why uh, this 
malwares have been doing. So that's why they are modifying the files that sometimes it is corrupt uh, it is it has become corrupted because code injection use the uh, over uh, buffer overflow condition so frequently use trampoline to code execution to explore ex exploit buffer overflow so for this one so code that is briefly used only to re redirect execution to some other location is much like a trampoline bouncing code from flow from one spot to another. So this is an example of address shell code and then it will bounce back to the dummy opcodes. So again, uh, uh, this is how the malwares, specifically viruses or worms, affected our files um, so that we have to be careful because it really can modify the files. Okay, uh, it's just okay if it is hidden but what if it really corrupted your files? So you have to take care of your files by installing antivirus software and firewall uh, applications. So is great programming required? So for the first step of determining the bug and second step of writing exploit code, yes. But then again, there are also attackers who uses the this program. So these are again the script kiddies. So, can run pre-written exploit code to attack a given system. So, attack code can get a shell with the process's owner's permissions or open a network port, delete files, download a program, and others. So, once a malware is already inside your computer system, uh, the attacker or hacker can control anything from your computer. So, you have really to be careful. Then, depending on the bug, attack can be executed across a network using allowed connections bypassing firewalls. And then, buffer overflow can be disabled by disabling stack execution or adding bit to page table to indicate non-executable state. So, this buffer overflow, uh, this, uh, disabling of this buffer overflow is available in Spark and x86, but still have security exploit. As I've said, Though the technologies is also um, being innovative, also, also are the malware because, of course, malware are programs too. Okay, so next is we have viruses. So what is a virus? It is a code fragment embedded in legitimate program. It is self-replicating, so it means it can infect other files. So as I've said, designed to infect other computers very specific to CPU architecture operating system and application. So that's why, um, actually in Linux, I don't know, I, I'm not, uh, I've, it's been a long time, I've not been a Linux user. But when I was using Linux, there are no viruses for Linux. But there is an antivirus for Linux. Um, and also, the viruses of uh, for Windows will not affect Mac OS and and Linux because as it is said that viruses are CPU uh, architecture is specific if it is a Windows virus then it will only work on uh, computers that uses Windows so why is it why are, are there are there viruses so for Windows it's because of course Windows is a propri proprietary software you're going to be pay you're going to pay for it for you to have a copy it's not really the source code but the executable file while for linux so linux is open source meaning um, the source code is free if you are a great if you are a good programmer and you want to create your own operating system and you want to name it uh, 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 for uh, based on your name so you can do that so that is the uh, linux is uh, the, the operating system is free and at the same time the source code is also free if you want to modify it and create your own operating system then you can do so then Mac OS of course is I, I don't know if there is already an, a, 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 a virus for Mac OS but for Linux since Linux is open source who in their right minds that it is already free then you're going to create a virus for that so it's like uh, how inhumane you are it's already free you don't need to pay for that and then you're still creating viruses for linux so I, that's the reason for 
as to why Windows has many viruses because you need to pay for the license to use that software. So viruses are usually born via email or as a macro. So a macro is a, um, um, for Excel, it's like you're recording actions uh, uh, in Excel. It's instead of you're going to do it, uh, for example, in one day you're going to do it 10 times, that process 1, 2, 3. Instead of repeating process 1, 2, 3, you need, it, it's, it's very convenient to use a macro. So you can, you don't need to do the processes three, uh, do the step processes one, two, three, one, two, three. You just need a macro. And then uh, usually there are also viruses that are developed by using this macro. And then we have my visual basic macro to reformat hard drive. So this uh, code uh, unknowingly, so it will for uh, it will reformat the hard drive. So there is a command that comes slash k format c. C is sometimes where the Windows is installed. So then VB hide. So this code, it's actually a visual basic macro. So macro can be useful, but at the same time, it's like a double-edged sword. Ma ma macro is very useful, but for if you use it for intend in its intended purpose, but if you're going to use it, of course, as a way to to destroy a computer system. So, of course, um, I hope that it will not be used that way. Okay, next is we have virus dropper. Inserts virus onto the system. So, many categories of viruses, literally many thousands of viruses exist. Okay, so we have file. So, file viruses are mostly parasitic, meaning they... Uh, they integrate themselves with the file. And then we, we have the boot. So, boot viruses are more of memory. So, this is also very dangerous because if a virus is uh, already infected your, your boot files, there is a possibility that your operating system will be corrupted. Then we have also the macro, as I've said, these are the series of actions that can be recorded. So we have for Visual Basic and we also have the Excel. So sometimes if your Excel files is detected with have a macro, there is a message that are you sure you want to run a macro because there are viruses that are produced by using macro. Then next is we have the source code. So looks for a source code and modifies it to include the virus and to help spread the virus. So by the source code itself. And then we also have this um, polymorphic to avoid having a virus signature. Polymorphic meaning the virus changes itself from one form to another because we have this so-called virus signature. So virus signature, it is a pattern that can be used to identify a virus, typically a series of bytes that make up the virus code. So that is why antivirus software can identify um, viruses because of their virus signature but there are also viruses that changes from one form to another so that the antivirus could not detect its virus signature or the pattern and then we have the encrypted includes description code decryption code rather along with the encrypted virus again to avoid detection and then we also have the stealth the stealth attempts to avoid detection by modifying ports uh Ports of the system that could be used to detect it. So, of course, for example, for the antivirus. And then we also have the tunneling. So, the tunneling means gets installed before an antivirus can detect it. So, that's the tunneling virus. And then multipartite. Multi so, able to infect multiple parts of a system, including both sectors, memory, and files. So, this is also very dangerous because it is a combination of um, file virus, a boot virus, and, of course, other um, types of viruses. So, that is why it is called multipartite. And then we have the so-called armored virus, obfuscated, that is written so as to be hard for the viru, antivirus to researchers to unravel and understand. So, armored, it is hidden. Okay? 
Okay, so this is an example of a boot sector computer virus. So the virus copies boot sector to unused location X. Then virus replaces original boot block with itself. So by means of that, uh, there's a possibility that your operating system is already uh, rendered unusable. And then at system boot, vi vi virus decreases physical memory, hides in memory above new limit. So that's why sometimes, uh, uh, for your if you, you you own a computer, you should know your computer personally how it behaves. So for example, you're doing this, it's okay at at the previous day. Then today, why is your fan is always in turbo mode? You can really hear the the fan. Uh, really, oh, why it's why it's uh, working? Then the CPU is one hundred percent. Your memory is one hundred percent. Then actually. As computer students, you should know how to diagnose your computer because if you see that it's very unusual, you're not doing anything as why is your CPU, your memory, and even your hard drive are all 100%. So I think there is something wrong. So you need to check what is happening with your computer. So that's why sometimes if your computer system behaves abnormally, it just means that it has possible it has a possibility that it is already has a virus in its computer system so that's why here at system boot so decreases physical memory so that's why your computer tends to be slower uh, when it has already ha 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 has the virus and then the virus attaches to the disk read write interrupt monitors all this disk activity so that's why your computer becomes slow and then this what happens so whenever new removable read write disk is installed, it infects this as well for the other media. And then it blocks any attempts of other programs to write the boot sector. And then it is a logic, it has a logic pump to wreak havoc at a certain date. So if that if boot sec if boot sector is already contracted in your computer system, so there is really a very big possibility that it has already a corrupted operating system and you need to reinstall it and then the threat continues of course as i've said again time and time again that um, technology has become innovative so as the malware so attacks are still common and still occurring attacks moved over time from science experiments to tools of organized crime and then uh, this organized crime, the purpose is to target specific companies specifically, of course, if this uh, companies has, uh, uh, for example, the Forbes 500 companies. So creating botnets to use as a tool for spam and DDoS delivery or the distributed denial of service. So I've already um, discussed that. Um, if, an, if an attacker removes the remote access tool or the rat, this can be used as botnets. And then we also have keystroke logger to grab passwords, credit card numbers. So these are softwares that can record the, the, the words that you have typed, even in the, uh, as long as the, your keyboard is used, it will log all the letters that you have typed. And then why is Windows a target for most attacks? Because it is most common, aside from, I've said, it's a proprietary software. And everyone is an administri administrator, is licensing required, of course, for Windows, for you to have, uh, for you to be allowed to use a software, licensing is required. So monoculture is considered harmful. So what is monoculture? In which many systems run the same hardware, operating system, and application software. So since... Windows is most common, we can say that, and it uses the same computer system. So we can say that we have mostly a Windows monoculture. So that's why we are more prone to viruses because most of the viruses that is uh, invented or created is for Windows computer systems. So again, you can... Uh, in order to avoid viruses, you can use Linux operating systems. And as you can see, uh, Windows viruses will not work on Android system. 
and vice versa. Android uh, system viruses will not also work in Windows system. Again, because viruses are CPU architecture specific. Okay, next is we have system and network threats. So some systems open rather than secure by default. What is secure by default? It describes a system or computer whose initial configuration decreases its attack surface. So, secure by default, reduce attack surface. So, what is attack surface? Some of methods available to attack a system, such as all of the network ports that are open plus physical access. So, if you don't want your computer to be affected, uh, affected by the virus, so, make it stand alone, no internet connection and no flash drives to be connected. That's the only way to protect. But of course, you need uh, internet connection for you to browse data and to get data. So, it's really inevitable. It's really very rare for a computer system to be a standalone unless there are really is no internet connection in your area. So, but it is harder to use the secure by default more knowledge needed to administer. So, network threats are harder to detect and prevent. Uh, why? Because protection systems are weaker, more difficult to have a shared secret on which to base access, and then no physical limits one system attached to the internet or on a network with system attached to the internet. Even determining location of connecting system is difficult. So, IP address is the only knowledge in which you can track the location of that particular computer system. Okay, continuation. So, aside from viruses, we have worms. So, use spawn mechanism. So, spawn mechanism, it means it replicates itself just like viruses. So, that's why it's worm. It's like it's crawling its way to all the parts that it can infect. And then, it is also a standalone program. So, internet worm. So, exploited Unix networking features or remote access and bugs in finger and send mail programs. So, exploited trust relationship mechanism used by RSH to access friendly systems without use of password. So, grappling hook program uploaded main worm program. So, grappling hook is the hook, for example, if you're going to climb a mountain, that hook is already the so-called grappling hook. So, worms are, are, are also like that. They attach themselves to the file just like with viruses. So, for this example, the grappling hook program contains 99 lines of C code and it's already a worm program. So, hooked system then uploaded main code, tried to attack connected systems, also tried to break into other users' accounts on local system via password guessing, if the target system already infected, abort except for every seven times. So, that is the grappling hook program. So, the, the, the worms also has this mechanism for flash drives. Because since flash drives has this autoplay feature, so once you always enable your autoplay, and autoplay is an executable file, so if autoplay is, um, is executed, uh, then the worm will... Um, spread. So, that is the, the, also the, in relation with the grappling hook program. Okay, next is we have the port scanning. So, automated attempt to connect to a range of ports on one, or one or range of IP addresses. So, detection of answering service protocol, and then detection of OS and version running on system. So, Nmap scans all ports in a given IP range for a response and we have this uh, command, Nessus, has a database of protocols and bugs and exploits to apply against a system. So, frequently launched from zombie system. So, what is a zombie system? Okay, a zombie system or systems are compromised systems that are being used by attackers without the owner's knowledge. So, that's why sometimes that remote access tools that is left behind after an attack that will be used uh, as a bot uh, to be a botnet or a zombie system for launching attacks that for uh, uh, the, the purpose of it is that uh, to decrease the traceability of the hacker because there are many computer he or she has used 
while doing the attack. So this is zombie systems, botnets, these are used for the denial of service attacks. Okay, I've already mentioned the denial of service. So, or DOS. So, ov overload the targeted computer preventing it from doing any useful work. So, we have a more sophisticated DO DOS, which is the distributed denial of service, come from multiple sites at once. Consider the start of the IP connection handshake or the syn uh, syn synchronous. How many started connections can the OS handle? Actually, it depends upon the OS. And then, consider traffic to a website. So, how can you tell the difference be between being a target and being really popular? So, because um, the OS, if you're considering the traffic, you don't know if it is really an attack or it's just many clients are checking your site. And then, it may be accidental. CS students writing bad fork function code. And then if it's purposeful or intentional, so it is used for extortion or punishment. For example, if you have a site, again, as I've said for the OS example, you have a site that uh, have these services. And then the attacker says, um, I will unload your server if you pay me this sum of money. Okay, then next is, of course, again, the port scanning. Automated tool to look for network port accepting connections. And port scanning is also a double-edged sword because it can be used for good and evil. So these are the standard security attacks. So this is the normal. So the sender will send communication to the receiver and vice versa. So then this is the masquerading. So the receiver thought that the person he or she is talking with is the sender, but not. It's already the attacker. And then man in the middle, of course, is the generic term for, uh, it's a more specific term, uh, general term for replay attack. So for this one, man in the middle, so the sender thought that the one is she is communicating with is the receiver. And this receiver thought that the person that he is communicating with is the sender, but not. It's uh, the attacker, actually. Okay, next is we have... Cryptography as a security tool. So this is the broadest security tool available. It is internal to a given computer. Source and destination of messages can be known and protected. So OS creates, manages, protect process IDs and communication ports. So um, OS is already as a some type of cryptography in itself. Then source and destination of messages on network cannot be trusted without cryptography. So, for let, not local network, is IP address works. So, consider an authorized host added. So, for local network, you already have a list of the uh, networks that is really included in your local network. If there is uh, an identified IP address, so it is considered not included in the local network. So, it's easier for local network. But how about for one or internet? So, how to establish authenticity? So, IP address is not the solution. So, let's delve more with regards to the cryptography. So, means to constrain potential senders or sources and or receivers or destinations of messages. So, cryptography is based on secrets or keys. And then, this enables confirmation of source, receipt only by certain destination, and trust relationship between sender and receiver. So that is the way on how you will secure authentication on a one or internet, to be general. So first is we have encryption. So constrains the set of possible receivers of a message. So encryption algorithm is consist of a set of k a set k of keys, set m of messages. Set C of ciphertext or encrypted messages. So we have a function E in which uh, this is the formula. So it just means that for small letter K, a subset of K. So E sub K is a function for generating the ciphertext from messages. So both E and E sub K for any K should be efficiently computable functions. And then we also have a function D. So, this is the formula. So, it means that for each k, 
is a subset of k. d sub k is a function for generating messages from ciphertext. So both d and d sub k for any k should be efficiently computable functions. So an encryption algorithm must provide this essential property. Given a ciphertext C, which is a subset of capital C, a computer can compute M such that E sub K function of M is equal to C only if it possesses K or the key. So thus, a computer holding K can decrypt ciphertext to plain text used to produce them, but a computer not holding K cannot decrypt ciphertext, of course, because you do not have the key. Then, since ciphertexts are generally exposed, for example, sent on the network, it is important that it is infis be infeasible to derive k from the ciphertext. Of course, you cannot, uh, since ciphertexts are available in public, so there should be no way that your key will be derived from the ciphertext. So, we have two types of encryption. The first is we have the symmetric encryption. So, same key is used to encrypt and decrypt. So, therefore, k must be kept secret. So, we have DES or the Data Encryption Standard was most commonly used symmetric block encryption algorithm created by the U.S. government. So, what does this do? Encrypts a block of data at a time. Key is too short, so now considered insecure. So, we have a triple DES or triple DES considered more secure. Algorithm used three times using two or three keys. So, this is for example. So, this is the key and then another one and then we have the third one. So, two or three keys. And in 2001, NIST, so NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, adopted new block cipher. The Advanced Encryption Standard or AES. Actually, AES is also used for Wi Fi connections. So, keys of 128, 192, or 256 bits works on 128 bit blocks. And then we have RC4. So, RC4 is, create, is meaning Rivest Cipher 4, version 4, is the most common symmetric stream cipher but known to have vulnerabilities. So, RC4 encrypts or decrypts a stream of bytes, such as wire in wireless transmission. And key is an input to pseudo random bit generator. So, it generates an infinite key stream. So, it is an infinite set of bits, the key stream, that can be used to encrypt a plain text stream through an XOR operation. If you can remember XOR gate, so XOR. It will only input 1 if the inputs are different. So, XOR is uh, exclusive, exclusive OR. And it uses only two, uh, it only uses two variables to compare. It will not compare three or more. If you want to compare it, for, pair first the, pair, for example, A, B, and C. If you want to use X, XOR, pair first A and B. Or just pair any A, B, A, C, or B, C. And then after pairing it, the results of A or B will be XOR to C. So that is the XOR. Okay, so we have secure communication over secure medium by using symmetric um, encryption. So we have this, the, mes uh, the sender. So of course it writes a message. And then it is a plain text. And then he, uh, he, she wants to convert it into a ciphertext. So it, she uses the encryption algorithm by using the encryption key. And then the attacker can get the ciphertext, but it, uh, he or she, uh, she, because she's a she, she cannot uh, decrypt the message because the attacker does not have the key. So though he can, he, uh, she can get the ciphertext, she can never decrypt the message. Then, um, the sender, she will send the key to the receiver or another, the receiver has another copy of the key, the same key that the send, sender has used. And then, to decrypt the message, there is a decrypt, decryption algorithm that is using the decryption key. So, that's why the decryption key and the encryption key that is used are just the same. And then, 
uh, after the decryption, it will have the plain text and uh, the receiver can already read the message that is sent by the sender. So that is the symmetric encryption. So we have another one. If we have the symmetric encryption, we have the asymmetric encryption. So public key encryption based on its user having two keys. We have the public key, published key used to encrypt data, and then we have the private key, key known only to individual user used to decrypt data. So, must be an encryption scheme that can be made public without making it easy to figure out the decryption scheme. So, most common is the RSA black cipher. What is RSA? So, RSA based on the author of the uh, asymmetric encryption, which is the right, which is composed of Rai Vest, Shamir, and Adelman. So, efficient algorithm for testing whether or not a number is prime. So, we will have a little mathematics here. No efficient algorithm is known for finding the prime factors of a number. So, continuation with asymmetric encryption. Formally, it is computationally infeasible to derive k sub dn from k sub en and so k sub e did not to be kept secret and can be widely disseminated. So, we have the k sub e is the public key and k sub d is the private key. And then n is the product of two large randomly chosen prime numbers p and q. For example, p and q are 512 bits each. Then the encryption algorithm is e sub k e and then n function of m is equal to m raised to k sub e mod n where k sub e satisfy k sub e times k sub d mod p, p minus 1 times q sub 1 is equal to 1. So the decryption algorithm is then d sub k d and n function of c is equal to c raised to k d mod n. So to further understand that, because these are all formulas, we have a following example. So you can see as asymmetric encryption as a mailbox. So actually mailbox is publicly known as long as you know the address of the mailbox. And then anyone can send messages to the mailbox. So it is known publicly that if you, for example, if I'm the one going to put a mailbox for person A. So if someone knew me that I I put a uh, put an envelope there, so it means it is publicly known that I was I sent a me um, as a message to to mailbox. So that is like a public key. While the private key, though the mailbox is publicly known, but the ones who can read the envelopes inside and the letters inside is the one who is the owner of the key to the mailbox. So that is the K sub D or private key. So uh, I gave you a, um, an analogy for you to understand how asymmetric encryption works. Okay, we have here an asymmetric encryption example. So for you to further understand this, so I'll, I'll access... Um, I will access, okay, an RSA calculator for you to understand more all about the RSA asymmetric encryption. So, RSA, there is an existing RSA calculator. Okay, so actually I've already accessed it for you to understand. Okay, so let's go back with our example. So, make P, so the given P is equal to 7 and Q is equal to 13. So we then calculate N. Actually, N is the product of P and Q. So P and Q, P times Q, 7 times 13 is equals to 91. And we have to get the P minus 1 times Q minus 1. So 7 will become 6 and 13 will become 12 for P sub 1. So this will be? So, this will become 6 and this will be since P minus 1, 7 minus 1 is equal to 6 and then Q is 13 minus 1, then, then, then this will become 12. So, P minus 1 times Q minus 1 is equal to 6 times 12 is equal to 72. We next select K sub E, relatively prime, 
prime to 72 and less than 72, yielding 5. Okay. Um, this is randomly. You can select any number as long as it is, it is relatively prime to 72. So, what is relatively prime? Relatively prime means you're going to compare two numbers and then if you compare these two numbers and their common factors is just one, the number one, it means they are relatively prime. So, so uh, for this one, if you want to do it manually, you have to think of the prime numbers. So, the prime numbers is 1, 2 is not, 3, 4 is not a prime number, then 5, 7, 8 is not, 9 is not, 10 is not, 11, so and so forth, all the prime numbers. Okay. So, actually, for selecting relatively prime to n, uh, rather to phi, rather it's not n, to phi, um, it should be between 1 and less than 72. 1 is not included. Okay? So, it's not, rel uh, it's not included in the selection. So, 1, 2, 3. 3 is relatively prime to 72. No, because 73 can be divided into can be divided into 3. So, 3 means it has 72 divided by 3 is equal to 24. So, they are not relatively prime. 4. And 4 is not, of course, a relatively prime. It's, a, it's, a, it's not, not prime. 5. 5 and 72, are they relatively prime? Of course, because the common, fac a common uh, factors to them both is one so that's why five is chosen and then next finally we calculate k sub d such that k sub e k sub d mod 72 is equal to one yielding 29 why uh, it, it works like this so your uh, k sub e is five and then you're looking for k sub d so look for a number when multiplied by five and then minus 1, it is divisible by 72. That is the meaning of that. So, k sub e is, actually using here, we're going to use trial and error here. So, 5 times 29 is what? So, again, uh, let's use technology, calculator. Okay, 5 times 29. So, we have 145 minus 1 is equal to 144 then let's look if it is divisible by 72 yes so that's why it is chosen as 29 okay because it's 5 times 29 is 145 minus 1 which is divisible by 72 actually you can use also any number as long as um it will be multiplied by 5 and then minus 1 and then that result if it is divided by 72 it is divisible by 72 any number can do so we have our keys for public key k n is we have 5 that is your public key k sub e and then your n is 91 and then private key is we have 29 and then our n is also 91 so, encrypting the message 69 with the public key results in the ciphertext 62. So, let's see our, in our RSA calculator. So, our P here is 7 and then our Q here is 13 as example. So, that's why our N, P times Q is equal to 91. And then our R, which is the 5 in other um, connot uh, connotations, P minus 1 times Q minus 1 is 72. Okay, these are the list of numbers for for uh, for I mod R. So, since what that one we choose is 5 times 29, we choose actually in the example is 145. So, find a number equal to 1 mod R which can be factored. So, we have 145 then factor k, so that's why 5 times 29. So that's why it is, uh, actually you can choose anything. As I've said, you can choose this one, 505, 577, as long if it is 
these are all these are all um, can be factored by 72 minus 1 it's always minus 1 because that's the um, that's the formula okay so we have 5 times 29 so next so find two numbers e and d so this is already the e this is your d that are relatively prime, prime to n for which e times d is equal to 1 mod r so use the factorization so this, since 145 is already factored uh, to factor k into two numbers e and d so your e here as you can remember that is 5 and then your d here is 29 okay so check e and d so your e is 5 your d is 29 n is 91 r is 72 so e and d is equal to 145 so e times d mod r is equal to 1 so e and r are relatively prime and e d and r are relatively prime so if your choices of e and d are acceptable you should see the message e e times d mod r is equal to 1 and r are relatively prime as you can already see so use e and d to decode encode and decode the message so in our example we have message 69 okay I'm going to encode and decode so the result for the encrypted as is already seen the cipher text becomes 72 this is the formula for what's why you get the um you got 62 okay if you really are not convinced let's use uh, i have another useful site here we have the wall from alpha Okay, it is free in the site, but if you're going to download the, uh, the Android version, you have to pay. So, enter what you want to calculate or to know about. So, let's go back with our calculator. So, we have, if you really are not convinced, so message is 69. Message is 69 raised to E, which is 5. Okay, so the caret raised to 5 and then okay then mod n okay eh, mod n mod mod 91 that's the n okay so as you can see the result is 62 so when you cipher uh, when decrypted so our message is cipher d which is 62 raised to d what is d we have 29 then mod 91 okay so that's why the result is 69 so that is the formula so this is an example of how does the RSA specific RSA is computed for the public key and private key. So ciphertext can be decoded with the private key. So public key can be distributed in clear text to anyone who wants to communicate with holder of public key. Okay, so we have this encryption using RSA asymmetric cryptography. So the sender writes a message, 69, then plain text, and then she uses the encryption key by using the RSA asymmetric cryptography. So 69 raised to 5 mod 91, so the result will be 62. So though it will be uh, acquired by the attacker or the hacker, uh, it's a cipher text, so it's useless because it does he uh, he or she does not have the key the private key next is we have we have this um, decryption key by using the 62 raised 29 mod 91 and then uh, the receiver will receive the original message so this is an example of the RSA asymmet asymmetric cryptography illustration so note symmetric cryptography based on transformations asymmetric based on mathematical functions so as you can see we used numbers 
So asymmetric, much more compute intensive as you can see. And typically do not, uh, is not used for bulk data encryption. That is the disadvantage of asymmetric cryptography because it cannot be used for larger sets of data. Okay, next is we have the authentication. So constraining set of potential senders of a message. So it is a complementary to encryption. Also can prove message unmodified. So the algorithm components for authentication is a set K of keys, a set M of messages, and a set A of authenticators. And then we have a function S. So the meaning of this formula is that for each K is a subset of K, the keys, S sub K is a function for generating authenticators from messages. And then both S and S sub K for any K should be efficiently computable function. And then we also have another function V and then true or false is a boolean. That is for every K subset of K, V sub K is a function for verifying authenticators on messages. So that's why it will output is it true or false, true that it is an uh, it is an uh, authentic um, user or of that message receiver of that message or not so both v and v sub k for any k should be efficiently computable functions so for a message m a computer can generate an authenticator a subset of a such that v sub k function of m and a is true only if it possesses k of course if you possess the key it means you are an authenticator. Thus, computer holding K can generate authenticators on messages so that any other computer possessing K can verify them. And then, computer not holding K cannot generate authenticators on messages that can be verified using V sub K. And then, since authenticators are generally exposed, for example, they are sent on the network with the messages themselves, if not, if ma it must not be feasible to derive K from the authenticators, just like with the cipher text. Practically, if V sub K function of M A is equal to true, then we know M has not been modified and that send of message has K. And then if we share K with only one entity, know where the message originated. So, authentication, it can also use hash functions. So, this is also a basis for authentication. So, creates small fixed size block of data message digest or hash value from M. So, message digest is the calculation resulting from a hash function. So, hash function H must be collision resistant on M, must be invisible to find an M prime is not equal to M such that um, hash function of M is equal to hash function of M prime. If hash function of M is equal to hash function of M prime, then M is equal to M prime. And it also means that the message has not been modified. So common message digest functions include MD5 or the message digest algorithm version 5, which produces 128-bit hash. And we have SHA-1, which means security uh, secure hash algorithm 1, which outputs a 160-bit hash. But the problem with hash function is not useful as authenticators. For example, um, hash function of M can be sent with a message. But if H is known, someone could modify M to M prime and recompute H, M, H function, hash function of M prime and modification not detected. So it must authenticate a hash function of M. Another one is authentication using MAC. So, symmetric encryption used in message authentication code or MAC authentication algorithm. Cryptographic checksum generated from message using secret key. So, what is message authentication or MAC? A cryptographic checksum calculated in symmetric encryption used to authenticate short values. So, it can securely authenticate short values as it, it is said in the definition. If used to authenticate hash function of M for an H that is collision resistant, then obtain a way to securely authenticate long message by hashing them first. 
So note that k is needed to compute both s sub k and v sub k. So anyone able to compute one compute uh, and one can compute the other. So another authentication is by using digital signature. So it is based on asymmetric keys and digital signature algorithm. So authenticators produced are digital signatures. So very useful. Anyone can verify authenticity of a message. So that's why uh, also application programs which are legitimate, they have their own digital signatures for the computer to identify them as, of course, these are legitimate programs. In a digital signature algorithm, computationally infeasible to derive k sub s from k sub v. Then v is a one-way function. Thus, k sub v is the public key and k sub s is the private key. Consider the RSA digital signature algorithm. So it is also similar to RSA encryption algorithm, but the key use is reversed. So digital signature of messages S sub K S uh, function of M is equal to H function of M raised to K sub S mode N. And then the key K sub S again is a pair of DN where N is the product of two large randomly chosen prime numbers P and Q. Then verification algorithm is V sub K V function of M and A such that A sub K sub V mod N is equal to H function of M. Where K sub V satisfies K sub V times K sub S mod P sub uh, mod P minus 1 times Q sub 1 is equal to 1. And digital signatures are also used for uh, to identify that a certain uh, person that's the signature um, uh, it is already used by uh, DICT or the Department of Information and Communications Technology. So why authentication is a subset of encryption. So fewer computations except for RSA digital signatures, authenticator usually shorter than message, sometimes want authentication but not the confidentiality, so signed patches and others, and then it can be basis for non-repudiation. So what is non-repudiation? Proof that an entity performed an action frequently performed by digital signatures. So next is we have the key distribution. So delivery of symmetric key is a huge challenge, sometimes done out of band. So out of band in networking, a term describing data delivered in a manner independent of the main data stream, such as delivery of a symmetric key in a paper document. So even symmetric key distributions need care because, of course, there, are, there is a man in the middle attack because maybe the sender thought that the that the the ones he or she is communicating is the receiver but not but it's the man in the middle okay next is we have the digital certificates proof of who or what owns a public key public key digitally digitally signed a trusted party trusted party receives proof of identifications from entity and certifies that public key belongs to entity and then we have the certificate authority. So, so these are trusted party. So their public keys included with browser distributions. They vouch for other authorities via digitally signing their keys and so on. Okay, we have the following illustration here, which is the man in the middle attack on asymmetric cryptography. So, of course, um, asymmetric cryptography has still vulnerabilities such as this illustration. So for here, example, the person who wants to receive an encrypted message send out his public key. So this um, sender send his uh, encrypted key. But of course, uh, but the attacker also sends her bad public key. So since this is the man in the middle attack, so the, uh, the, the key is received by the attacker and at the same time the attacker receive uh, sends uh, her dis uh, decryption key to the receiver and then this bad public key which matches her private key so the persons who want to send the encrypted message knows no better and so uses the bad key to encrypt the message so then the attacker then happily decrypts it so this is the an example of uh, 
um, asymmetric cryptography. So there is, the sender uh, has no knowledge that uh, her, his, uh, his original um, key was not 10, but it's received by the attacker. And uh, this attacker post, uh, post as the sender himself to the receiver. Okay, next is we have the implementation of cryptography can be done at various layers of ISO reference model. So, you will have this uh, networking subject. So, SSL or the secure sockets layer at the transport layer. Network layer is typically IPsec. So, IPsec which defines IP packet formats that allow the insertion of authenticators and encryption of the packet contents. So, IKE for key exchange or internet key exchange. And then, this is the basis for virtual private networks or the VPNs. So, why not just at lowest level? So, sometimes need more knowledge than available at low level, such as user authentication and email delivery. So, you're going to study the OSI model in an um, networking uh, course. Okay, so encryption example, which is the TLS. So, insertion of, in, of cryptography at one layer of the ISO network model or the transport layer. So, they have the SSL or the secure socket layer also called the uh, TSL. So, trans, uh, um, sec cryptographic protocol that limits two computers to only exchange messages with each other. So, it's very complicated with many variations. So used between servers and browsers for secure communication such as credit card numbers. So the server is verified with a certificate assuring client is talking to correct server. And then asymmetric cryptography used to establish a secure session key or the symmetric encryption for bulk of communication during session. And then communication between each computer then uses symmetric key cryptography. So, what is the session key? This is the TLS symmetric key used for a web communication session exchanged via asymmetric cryptography. So, there are more details uh, in the reference book uh, and, and of course in the internet with regards to TLS. Okay, next is we have the user authentication. So, crucial to identify user correctly. So, as protection systems depend on user ID. So, user's identity most often established through passwords. So, this is the most commonly used. Can be considered a special case of either keys or capabilities. So, passwords must be kept secret. So, to manage your password, is you should have a frequent change of passwords. History to avoid repeats. And then, use a non-guessable password by using, um, for example... Um, not using your personal information, your favorite number, your birthday, or any other information that can be uh, can be derived from your. Per uh, uh, you should not put any um, um, password that's related to your personal information. In other words, so log all invalid access attempts, but not the passwords themselves. So this is an example for an ATM. Example you. Uh, uh, entered incorrect PIN and example in land bank if three successive unsuccessful attempts will block you for one day that, that is the mechanism so or most cases you'll be blocked so that, that is why so as much as possible you have to remember your password because it means that if you forget it uh, uh, for three times it's a it's a possibility that you really are not the owner of the uh, of the card, for example, and then unauthorized transfers, of course, uh, by means of social engineering. So you have to make your passwords be in secret. Then passwords may also either be encrypted or allowed to be used only once. So does encrypting passwords solve the exposure problem? So. So, the Unix system actually uses secure hashing. So, might solve uh, sniffing. It, uh, it, you also have to consider shoulder surfing because by shoulder surfing or 
uh, the person will get the data by looking at the screen of your uh, of the login. So that's why, as I've said, password masks are used by using asterisk or dots. Then consider Trojan horse keystroke logger because even though the, there is a password mask uh, for the keystroke logger, all the keys that is um, that is uh, used uh, in, in in site or in any other applications will be recorded in the keystroke logger. So how are passwords stored at authenticating site? So as I've said, so Unix uh, uses secure hashing. So next is we have passwords. So encrypt to avoid having to keep secret. So but keep secret anyway, of course, such as Unix uses super user only readable files such as it is allocated in the a directory etc then slash shadow. Then use algorithm easy to compute but difficult to invert. Only encrypted password stored never decrypted. Add salt to avoid the same password being encrypted to the same value. So what is this salt? These are recorded random number in the hashing algorithm. Though we are also we are also using the one-time password or the OTP. This is already implemented, for example, in Shopee. Um, if you're a user who hasn't logged in to Shopee um, in a most in a, a very long period of time, it will send an a code uh, to your cell phone to make sure that you are still that you really are the you the you really are the one who is logging in in that system. So that is OTP. So the problem with OTP is that what if you're, you've changed your phone numbers? For example, banks are also using this. For example, you're going to use your credit card. Then they will, they will have this uh, OTP. What, again, what if your uh, phone numbers are not updated? So you should call the bank or, for example, update in Shopee your number so that the code will be sent to your current number. So this OTP, as continued with the discussion, use a function based on seed to compute a password, both user and computer, and then hardware device or calculator or key fob to generate the password. And then it changes very frequently for OTP. So we can also use biometrics. So some physical attributes, we have fingerprint or hand scan. Um, you can use also the retina, the retina scan of your eyes. And then we also have this multi-factor authentication. Need two or more factors for authentication, such as if the company worker has a USB dongle and then a biometric measure, it's either fingerprint, hand scan, or retina, and a password. So that's multi-factor. One, two, three. Uh, three ways to authenticate that you really are a worker or can access those um, vicinity or places. Okay, so strong and easy to remember passwords. So let me uh, allow me to read this um, passage so that you can have an idea of a uh, strong and easy to remember passwords. So it is extremely important to use a strong or hard to guess and hard to shoulder surf passwords on critical systems like bank accounts. It is also important to not use the same password on lots of systems. As one less important, easily hacked system could reveal the password you can use on more important systems. A good technique is to generate your password by using the first letter of each word of an easily remembered phrase using both upper and lower characters with a number of punctuation mark thrown in for good measure. For example, you really love your girlfriend. The phrase, my girlfriend's name is Catherine, might yield the password capital M, G for the girlfriend, then N for the name, then you have dot, I, S, is, then capital K for Catherine. So the password is hard to crack but easy for the user to remember. Of course, the user, if you really have a girlfriend named Catherine. A more secure system would allow more characters in its password. So that's why uh, the requirement for most of the password should be at least 8 characters long. So indeed, a system might also allow passwords to include the space character so that a user could create a passphrase which is easy to remember but difficult to break. So that is an advice for strong and easy to remember passwords. So next is we have implementing security defenses. So defense in depth is most common security theory. So it means it just means multiple layers of security. Then security policy describes what is being secured. 
Then, vulnerability assessment compares real state of system or network compared to security policy. And then, we have intrusion detection endeavors to detect attempted or successful intrusions. We have signature-based detection spots known bad patterns because they already have this pattern. So, that's why it's signature-based detection. Anomaly detection spots differences from normal behavior. It can detect zero-day attacks. What is the meaning of zero-day? So, zero-day attacks, attacks that have not been seen before and therefore cannot be detected via their signatures. So, an example of anomaly detection is for spotting fraudulent transaction in, uh, in your credit card example. What if you're the person, example, your behavior is you're buying, you're using your credit card to buy clothes. For example, you're using your credit card monthly, 1,000, if, if exactly 1,000 pesos, uh, for example, for, for, uh, for, a, for a clothing. Every month, you've been doing that. So, the, the, the one who monitors credit card transactions uh, can already sense that, oh, the user is the one who uses that credit card because um, he or she is always uh, spending or using her credit card for clothing. Then at one time, at, at the next month, instead of uh, buying clothes, um, the credit card is used for buying gadgets worth 100,000 pesos. So for the, for the person who monitors the bank uh, credit card transactions, uh, basically, what they're doing is they're going to call the owner of the credit card of the of the credit card. Why? To verify if really he or she is the one who you who used the credit card at that time. Because as you can see, the behavior is uh, she is buying clothes. Then the next month, why is he or she buying gadgets worth one hundred thousand pesos? So that's already it's like for them, it's already an anomaly. It's not a normal behavior, for example, for a person. So, uh, they need to call the owner of the credit card. And, of course, if he or she is the one that he really do bought that uh, device, so that's already fine. But, of course, if he or she does not, is the, the one who did not transact and buy those devices, so it's up to the bank to block and not to allow uh, of course, for for the credit card owner to pay for that uh, for that device, so that's why if you if you someday you're going to have a credit card and then uh, don't be irritated if they're going always to verify if you really bought or you didn't use the credit card. It's also for your own safety, just to make sure that um, you're the one who really spent that because based on the on the monitoring and your behavioral pattern. It's very different from your usual. You're only buying clothes worth 1,000 pesos every month. So that's an ex example of anomaly detection. So we also have these false positives and false negatives, so which is also a problem. So false positives are also called false alarms. Results indicating that something is a match to what is being detected even though it is isn't. So that is why it is called a false alarm. While false negatives or an example is a missed intrusion, results indicating that something is not a match to what is being detected even though it is. So, for implementing security defenses, another one is for virus protection, searching all programs or programs at execution for known virus patterns. So, it's very, very, uh, a very good practice is to Every time you inserted a device, a flash drive, or a file you downloaded, scan it first with your antivirus software. Or run in sandbox so it can damage the system. So I already discussed what is a sandbox. And then next is we have auditing, accounting, and logging of all or specific system or network activities. And then also practice safe computing. So avoid sources of infection. Download from only good sites. So it means good sites. Uh, it really is a reputable site, not this site that contains pop-ups and has viruses, uh, which are mostly contained in adults' uh, websites. Okay, continuing. So, firewalling to protect systems and networks. So, a network firewall is placed between trusted and untrusted hosts. 
the firewall limits network access between these two security domains. So for firewall, these two security domains is just the trusted and untrusted host. So, for the formal definition of security domain, separation of systems and devices into classes with each class having similar security needs. Okay, so for, uh, for firewall, so can be tunneled or spoofed. So, tunneling allows this allowed protocol to travel within allowed protocol, telnet inside of hypertext transfer protocol. Or the, we have... Firewall rules typically based on host name or IP address, which can also be spoofed. So, personal firewall is a software layer on given host. It can monitor or limit traffic to and from the host. So, uh, the one that is really tested, though it's free, is the zone alarm. And then we also have this application proxy firewall, understands application protocol and can control them such, this, such that the SMTP, which is the simple mail transfer protocol and then we also have this system called firewall monitors all important system calls and apply rules to them so such as this program can execute that system call so actually um, OSS have their own firewall the firewall that can be installed by the user which is the personal firewall or application proxy firewall and system call firewall So, we have an example here of a network security through domains preparation via firewall. So, this is the firewall. So, for this illustration, the company's computers can access the internet, but the internet has no other way to, ac uh, to, to access back. So, that's why the direction is uh, from the company's computers to the internet because of the firewall. At the same time, uh, company computers can access between, uh, can access the DMZ or the demilitarized zone. It is a security domain less trusted than some other security domains, such as domain containing a web server compared to the domain containing crucial company database. And of course, DMC cannot access the company's computers because of the firewall. And at the same time, internet can access uh, uh, to, the, uh, to DMZ, but not the other way around because of the firewall next is we have computer security classifications so u.s department of defense outlines four divisions of computer security namely a b c and d so d has the has the most minimal security c provides discretionary protection through auditing and it is divided into c sub c1 and c2 c1 define identifies cooperating users with the same level of protection while c2 allows user level access control then next is b all properties of c however each object may have unique sensitivity labels and it is also further divided into b b1 b2 and b3 and then a uses formal design and verification techniques to ensure security so to summarize all the security defenses and all the uh, all the uh, what we have to do to take care of our system so by applying appropriate layers of defense we can keep systems safe from all but the most persistent attackers in summary these layers may include the following so first is educate users about safe computing don't attach devices of unknown origin to the computer such as flash drives which is um used in any other system which is infected by the virus for example don't share passwords use strong passwords as already advised how to make strong and easy to remember passwords avoid falling for social engineering appeals realize that an email is not necessarily a private communication and so on so do not send sensitive information via email next educate users about how to prevent phishing attacks so, don't click on email attachments or links from unknown or even known senders. So, if there is an attachment such as, for example, a link to a site in which the site is unknown or typically not a typical um, uh, website link or if it really, lo uh, really looks like a decent um, link, you must also verify the sender. If the sender really sends it, is it really the one, the sender who sends that email? 
and then authenticate, for example, via a phone call that request is legitimate. Next, use secure communication when possible, then physically protect computer hardware, then configure the operating system to minimize the attack surface, disable all unused services. So, uh, to configure the operating system, you must always update your operating system to uh, solve the loopholes that is la la uh, later found by the programmers of the OS. And then, configure system daemons, privileges, applications, and services to be secure as possible. So, in continuation, use modern hardware and software as they are likely to have up-to-date security features. So, keep systems and applications up-to-date and patched, as I've said. Only run applications from trusted sources, such as those that are code-signed or digitally-signed or there is a certificate uh, for that particular application. And then, enable logging and auditing. Review the logs periodically or automate alerts. Install and use antivirus software on systems susceptible to viruses and keep the software up to date. So, for antivirus software, which are you going to use? Free or paid? Um, for basic protection, of course, uh, free is already okay. But if you really want to have a strong protection, you should opt to buying. But if you really are practicing already safe computing, I think antivirus with a free version, for me, in my opinion, it is already fine as long as you are practicing safe computing um, techniques. And then next is, is use strong passwords and passphrases and don't record them where they could be found. For example, you're writing it in a notebook right, or saving it in your phone. What if your phone is being stolen? And then use intrusion detection firewalling, and other network-based protection systems as appropriate. Though, again, Windows have their own firewall. Um, it is recommended to have another firewall. And then, as tested, um, Zone Alarm is already a very fine firewall, and it is free. And then, for important facilities, use periodic vulnerability assessments and other testing methods to test security and response to incidents. So, these are used, for example, for big companies to test if they're security is really secure and then encrypt mass storage devices and consider encrypting important individual files as well there are software that you can do that and windows is also a way to encrypt your uh, uh, drives and then have a security policy for important systems and facilities and keep it up to date so we have an example how does the windows 10 um have security features so security is based on user accounts so if you are the administrator so you have all the privileges so each user has a unique security id then log into id creates security access token so the security access token includes security id for user for users groups and special privileges then every process gets copy of token and then system checks token to determine if access allowed or denied. So that's why um, if you have a guest ID, you can only view but you cannot install or uninstall other programs. So that is the limit for a guest account. Then uses a subject model to ensure access security. So a subject tracks and manages permissions for each program that a user runs. So, each object in Windows has a security attribute defined by a security descriptor. So, for example, a file has a security descriptor that indicates the access permission for all users. That is the meaning of this uh, security descriptor. So, how about, so, continuation. Windows added mandatory integrity controls. So, assigns integrity label to each securable object and subject. And then, subject must have access, uh, access requested in discretionary access control list to gain access to object. And also, security attributes described by security descriptor, such as the owner ID, group security ID, discretionary access control list, and system access control list. And other objects are either container objects or objects containing other objects, for example, a file system directory or non-container objects the opposite of course of container objects so by default an object created in a container inherits permissions from the parent object 
So some Windows 10 security challenges result from security settings being weak by default, the number of services included in the Windows 10 system, and the number of applications typically installed in a Windows 10 system. So actually, this should be Windows 10 and not Windows 7 because the latest Windows operating system of Windows is Windows 10. Okay, so that is the end of the chapter. So I hope that you've learned something. Of course, it's very important for security. I hope that you remember the security defenses that we must do, such as uh, practice safe computing, use strong and easy to remember passwords, and then, of course, um, do not go to untrusted sites, and so on and so forth. So I hope that by this lesson, uh, you will be knowledgeable enough and you will be responsible enough of your own computer system that in order to protect your computer system, we must use and practice safe computing. So if you do have any questions, so please feel free to comment below and do not forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. So again, thank you very much. Good day, stay safe and God bless to all of you.